have this unfortunate role. Every time you come from the UK to Europe, you're a bringer of bad news. Uh, and I feel a little bit just the same again, that uh, this, is, this is my role, to, to come from the future with bad news about uh, how neoliberal governmentality uh, changes the landscape in which we work and how we can work. And I'm looking forward to the day where I will come from the past, not the future. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, also like Yuri said, I'll try and make this quite short because I think a lot of what I wanted to say has actually already been mentioned, I think, both uh, in the talk before and, and also in the case study, if you want to call it that, of the cultural politics of, of Barcelona. Uh, but I, also because, as we mentioned, I'm quite ill, as you can hear, so um, my, my voice will give out in a minute, so I'll try and make this more... Uh, <clears throat> some points for some points of observation really like a response and then we can continue the discussion that I think was quite fascinating because I also believe that the best way to discuss this is to go into each of the case studies rather than in a general theoretical sense uh, so uh, I want to uh, first discuss a little bit the historical role of, uh, of art institutions uh, and then how uh, a lot of practitioners certainly from my generation have uh, thought about these terms and how we could perhaps change the institution of being something that was perhaps disciplinary into something that was emancipatory. Uh, and then also the changes that has happened in the last 10 years. I think uh, Enos was very uh, correct in saying that there are major changes in the last 10 years, which I think has to do really with uh, 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 structural changes that are uh, uh, in terms of political economy, as much as in terms of uh, direct regulation of what you can show or not show, even though those instances, of course, happen as well. Um, finally, I would like to maybe say that uh, um, this exhibition can be seen from a political point of view as a major success, actually. And I hope that you will see it that way too, Enos. Uh, because it... Uh, uh, well, it's, 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 it's interesting now you're saying there's so many people from different points of view writing about it, which they wouldn't have if there hadn't been a controversy. So it becomes this kind of uh, uh, symbolic uh, space of projection where everybody feels they need to have a stake in this work. So I think that's probably the biggest success one can have for the work of art. Um, well, there's an economic, economic success too, I suppose. <coughs> so, uh, yeah, on a, on a, in my day job, I teach curating, so we discuss these issues all the time. And one of the things we, we always uh, discuss is, is, the, is the notion of in, 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 in the West of what, what the exhibitionary complex is supposed to do. Uh, and and uh, that, so I'd like to return to uh, Tony Bennett's famous essay for two reasons, uh, and hopefully that will become clear. But um, I'll just quote, it's easier than we go through it. So, uh, in a key passage in this text, which is of course a text about governmentality and a kind of, uh, uh, for those who've read it, it's, it's, it's the birth of the museum, it's the book, the text, the essay is called The Exhibitionary Complex. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a way of trying to use uh, uh, Foucault's notions of disciplinary society and to an extent governmentality in terms of cultural institutions as the, the genesis of the modern project of the, of the uh, both, and a, both exhibition making and art institutions. So what I find useful about this text from Bennett is that the exhibitionary complex exactly does not differentiate between the curatorial act and then the position of the director. And I think it's also important that, that we don't do that. I agree with Hans there. So uh, Bennett writes, this is a very famous quote, you've probably all heard it many times before. The exhibitionary complex was a response to the problem of order but one which worked differently in seeking to transform that problem into one of culture. A question of winning hearts and minds, as well as the discipline and training of bodies. As such, its constituent institutions reversed the orientations of the disciplinary apparatuses in seeking to render the forces and principles of order visible to the populace, transformed here into a people, a citizenry, rather than vice versa. They thought not to map the social body in order to know the populace by rendering it visible to power. Instead, and I think this is interesting in terms of really also of this discussion of the beast and the uh, 
shows exactly the role of governmentality in this equation. Instead, the provision of object lessons in power, the power to command and arrange things and bodies for public display, they thought to allow the people, en masse rather than individually, to know rather than to be known, to become the subjects rather than the objects of knowledge. Yet, ideally, they sought also to allow the people to know and hence regulate themselves, to become, in seeing themselves from the side of power, both the subject and objects of knowledge, knowing power and what power knows, which I think is the key, and knowing themselves as ideally known by power, interiorizing its gaze as a principle of self-surveillance and hence self-regulation. Uh, so this is, of course, the historical uh, 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 role of national museums, later also bourgeois museums. Uh, and uh, what that implies is a kind of socio-ontological approach to, to what uh, yeah, the exhibitionary complex can do. Uh, and therefore, of course, a lot of work has been in, in trying to reverse some of these terms. To, to use the same building blocks, this is a kind of what we call a counter-public strategy, to use the same building blocks in order to emancipate people from power and maybe not see yourself from the side of power, but see yourself outside of power and responding to power. So this, I think, has been one of the, 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 the major challenges. Uh, I think this is, this is uh, really been a challenge, of course, when you then try to work in institutions and can you reverse uh, these, uh, th this mode of address that situates subjects uh, uh, as both subjects and objects of knowledge. How, how, how is that possible within that very relation? Or would that mean uh, a, a, a more complete or partial uh, institutional transformation that has to do with the mode of address of the exhibition itself, with the architecture, with, the with, with all the mediation, uh, and not least the constituency uh, of the place? And here I think Kunstvereins are an interesting historical example because, of course, they are historically bourgeois public spaces. But nonetheless, of course, they principally have a constituency, which is something that national museums less and less have at a moment when it's very unclear what it means to be a national citizen, even though we are nonetheless always subjected to the laws, uh, if not the rights of national citizenry. But moreover, there's something uh, that, I, that, that struck me <clears throat> when reading this with students last week, and thinking particularly of this case. Uh, I always found that the ending to this essay was a little bit uh, hasty and a little bit too uh, dramatic. Uh, because um, Bennett's argument is that uh, institutions of art are disciplinary in the way that they teach you how to behave properly. So stop becoming a beast. And there's an example in, in, uh, in the opening of the British Museum, how many uh, thousands of constables were situated for the first opening because uh, uh, they were so afraid that uh, working class subjects would uh, act too beastly. Uh, so they set out a lot of constables in order to allow the, the proletariat into the hallowed halls of the National Museum. <coughs> um, so, there's that element of discipline, but moreover, of course, the main argument the, where um, Bennett disagrees with Foucault is that they are not only disciplinary, they are also, if not emancipatory, as some of us would like them to be, they are also um, entertaining. That they try to persuade you, not just by force, but by uh, charm. This week, charm of the bourgeoisie. Or the, um, the charm of the uh, inintelligible in objects of artists. So, in that sense, that the, 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 the strange art objects that you put into the museum are a kind of disorder, but the ordering is done by the museum and by the curator, of course, that then allows you to talk about irrational things in a rational manner, which is a training ground, of course, for political speech in the bourgeois public sphere. Um, but towards the end of this essay, and, it, uh, and as I said, it always felt like it was a very abrupt end, um, Bennett somehow returns to, the, um, to punishment, to, the, to, uh, to discipline and punishment, actually. Uh, and he writes, this is the very last line, um, museums were also typically located at the center of cities where they stood as embodiments, both material and symbolic, 
of a power to show and tell, which in being deployed in newly constituted open and public space, sought recipe to incorporate the people within the processes of the state. It really sounds like a uh, mission statement of Mark Bahn. <laughs> if the museum and the penitentiary thus represented the Janus face of power, there was nonetheless, at least symbolically, an economy of effort between them, which is kind of the whole essay has been about the opposite. So, for those who failed to adopt the tutelary relation to the self promoted by popular schooling, of whose uh, or whose hearts and minds failed to be one in the new pedagogic relations between state and people symbolized by the open doors of the museum, the closed walls of the penitentiary threatened a sterner instruction in the lessons of power. Where instruction and rhetoric fail, punishment began. I think that's pretty much what happened no, in this case. <coughs> uh, so, of course, this also, I think, said as, as been said before, so maybe I won't go uh, so much into it. Uh, what, of course, the, 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 the curators are doing, uh, because the process of selection is an integral part of their work. Uh, so it's not only presentation, it's also selection, it's also judgment that they pass on artists and, if you will, on their audience. Mm -hmm. So, in that sense, uh, uh, one of the most kind of misunderstood uh, pieces of writing from this kind of post-structuralist French tradition in art theory and in the art world is, I think, uh, Chacon's, Chacon shares ideas of the politics of aesthetics. Uh, because if you uh, look into some of Francia's more political writings, you will see that uh, it's very difficult to talk about curating as politics of aesthetics. Um, he writes in disagreement, politics is generally seen as the set of procedures whereby the aggregation and consent of, of the collectives is achieved. The organization of powers and the distribution of places and roles and the system for legitimizing this distribution. I propose to give this system of distribution and legitimation another name. I propose to call it the police, again a very famous quote. Uh, now, as I've said on many occasions, I propose that we give the same name to the legitimation and distribution processes of the art world the curators are involved in. Namely that we are a kind of police officers, policing aesthetics, uh, not necessarily politicizing it. Indeed, of course, in Russia, politics only happens at the moment of rupture when those who have no place claim their place, which tends to happen not very often, particularly in contemporary art institutions. So, uh, if we return to the case of, uh, of Enos's work within this framework, often misread uh, by art critics, uh, <coughs> we can see clearly that the museum here, then, is not the realm for politics, but for policing. In this case, curators and directors are police officers rather than political agents. Uh, and here, of course, in the case of this, this decision, uh, in the most crude form, that of the petty, petty police, uh, which, of course, brings in a whole other discussion. We, we discussed this idea of good or bad management. We could also say, is this good or bad policing that was done by me? <coughs> Either way, I think the function of the museum uh, and its curatorial uh, processes are that of policing aesthetics, not politicizing it. And indeed, of course, this would lead us to understand some sort of logic that at the moment of politicization, precisely the curators were fired. <coughs> so, uh, this, of course, public role has at the same time, of course, been changed quite drastically, and, and we've, we've talked about this. I don't know if it's about soft censorship or hard censorship, but it's of course in a kind of realignment in the way that art is produced and distributed, uh, which uh, has to do with uh, so-called neoliberal reform, of which there is nothing liberal. Uh, there's no, there's no, there's really no connection to the to the to the ideals of liberalism, maybe to the reality of its colonial history. Uh, but what it basically means. Uh, I'll make this very short because it's quite boring. What it basically means in terms of, of, of uh, art institutions and all cultural institutions is uh, uh, defunding and privatization. On the one hand, and on the other hand, more regulation in terms of uh, health and safety and um, sensitivity to various communities and certainly sensitivity to, to the national. So. Um, 
I think the situation in in in, uh, in public uh, institutions, uh, not only in the UK but all across Europe, is very similar to the one that we find in universities that I talked about last time I was here, which is on the one hand you get the kind of the worst of both worlds. So on the one hand, your economy is completely separated from the state, but the rules to which you adhere, your statutes, are more and more controlled by the state. So uh, you have on the one hand this kind of liberalization of your economy, but in ter terms of government sanity, it's actually increased. Uh, which means, of course, that your workload is also increased. As the one hand, you have to do much more work in terms of administration, uh, uh, reporting, uh, yeah, and, and it's, it's a kind of uh, in, internal registration, also what's called line management, one word. Uh, uh, and then, of course, you have to spend more and more time on, on fundraising. And this, of course, has, uh, uh, I think, a lot of um, implications on, on what can be shown. Um, I think there was a um, documentary 13, I think there was a wonderful diary from Harbin Farocki that was published afterwards, where he describes uh, the work that he wanted to do for this exhibition, which was to find uh, all the footage that was shot from the uh, Football World Cup final in Berlin in 2006. Uh, so from the aerial views of the stadium to the city security cameras to uh, all the, the close-ups, so there's like, I don't know, 45 cameras that of course are shooting for several hours. So he wanted to collect all this material. Uh, and uh, um, it's, but what's so interesting is that on the one hand that this organization that is now under a lot of scrutiny for its corruption, FIFA, did not really think there was anything interesting in, in, in lending out this footage. So you see this more commercial uh, industry of spectacle really uh, kind of contemporary art would be quite low on hierarchy compared to that. Uh, and secondly, of course, they ask for a lot of money. Uh, and it's in detail described in his diary how um, uh, the curators and uh, the, the main producer uh, uh, tried to get uh, the funding for this project uh, from a patron, um, so which was uh, Francesca van Habsburg, uh, who were very basically said to them, "I would like nothing more than to fund a fantastic installation by by Harbin Forky, but I really hate football." <laughs> And he describes how his heart dropped and that there's no way we can get the money. For this. So you will see that you all of a sudden become very uh, dependent on the, st on the tastes of the sovereign, which may be more or less progressive, more or less individual, more or less politicized, we don't know. Um, but it's not then a question of producing uh, major museum shows and specifically biennials uh, through a model of uh, curatorial selection uh, aesthetic judgment and um, public mediation, public good. You need to have a private, spon uh, private public spon uh, collaboration. Indeed, museums, for example, in the UK by the Arts Council, but still get Arts Council support, are getting the support only uh, to the degree in which they are capable of raising private funds. So each year they have been giving a new target of how many percentages they have to raise themselves and are rewarded on that. So the public funding is dependent on the private funding. And indeed we can see of course at the same time uh, as austerity measures are implemented of course all across Europe, the Arts Council in the UK said that they were more interested in quality than just reducing everybody. Quality, because of course, if you reduce everybody by 15, 10 percent every year, then we know that the production values and the, and the capabilities of these institutions will generally get low. So they wanted to make a quality assessment between those that they um, that they thought were doing a specialist good job and others. So some institutions lost all their funding, others kept their funding, and even others had increased funding. So the only ones that had an increased funding uh, was. Um, working properly, but um, Art Angel, which is a completely private company that does uh, a major kind of spectacular public artworks. They had, uh, uh, they had their public funding doubled at a time when uh, there is apparently austerity measures in place because of the way that they are capable of working with uh, 
foundations and private capital. So and you can then see, of course, that the places that lost all their funding, I'll just use three examples I think that are interesting, uh, because of the way that they think of their constituency. Uh, one was uh, Mute, which is somehow part of a kind of uh, uh, knit art activism <coughs> uh, leftist scene in the UK, for those who know the magazine, they lost all their funding. Uh, also the, the, the feminist film curatorial collective Electra lost all their money. And of course Iniva, which is, was originally the place for uh, Black Britain and later on the post-colonial discourse in the UK lost all their funding. So it's, it's, it's interesting in terms of how they see their constituency as very specific, those are the ones that lost their funding. But again, this happens through uh, uh, funding structures, so not, of course, through any censorship of saying you can't show uh, so-and-so, it's rather that you simply defund uh, uh, those institutions. This, of course, also has implications for uh, um, the idea of uh, the, or the precariousness of, uh, of independent curators. So, um, for example, uh, I was uh, recently relieved from a contract from the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denmark, where I'm from, uh, because uh, they were not happy with uh, the fundraising efforts that they themselves had done. And in the contract it stipulates that the institution is not uh, obliged, of course, to do the project if the funding is not <coughs> successful according to the budget. So you can see that through the, through the logic of the budget, the logic of funding schemes, is how you control uh, what is shown and what is not shown. <coughs> so, so uh, this I think leads to a, a, a couple of uh, potential potentials, uh, potential ways out of this uh, problem. I think. Um, but they're not so easy. But I would say that there are there are there are two that I would like to, to, to point to. Excuse me. And that, 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 that maybe we can discuss. Yeah. <laughs> so one is of course uh, what was also mentioned, the idea of withdrawal or exodus. I think that with, with withdrawal or exodus one has to understand it as only partial, as an oscillation, so not so of course you could just leave the art world. Uh, but uh, maybe uh, to do it at strategic points, uh, and maybe do it in terms of defunding, or in terms of divestment. So, uh, as practitioners within this field, there's nothing that forces us to uh, visit biennials. There's nothing that forces uh, art critics to just write about biennials and major museum shows. So I think you can divest from these uh, institutions. Moreover, of course, you can do that uh, in terms of uh, politics. So uh, there is something called Liberate Tate in the UK at the moment, which is trying to have them divest from their collaboration with BP Oil. Uh, there is also other types of boycotts uh, of that kind, um, only partially successful. But what that leads me to is the, 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 the second element, which I think that this particular case was uh, it's interesting in terms of the solidarity that all of you who worked on it mentions. Namely to think of um, institutions, art institutions, as spaces of conflict. And not just as a conflict on, around aesthetics uh, between uh, curators, directors and artists. And to not only think of uh, power relations in terms of politics and representation, so what you can show or not show, but in terms of political economy. So what is the political economy of these spaces? And how do we divest from them? And how do we turn them into conflicts of a kind of labor struggle? And I think there are many uh, 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 interesting examples of that, uh, particularly around uh, biennials. So I think, from, from my perspective, it's good that biennials start to crack up a little bit. And that you, for example, have um, both, uh, we can discuss the, 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 the individual political cases, but that you have both, of course, the, 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 the whole debate uh, in uh, Sao Paulo around funding, uh, in that case, uh, from Israel. I don't particularly agree with their decision, but that's another story. Uh, but also, of course, the, the, the discussion that you've had in Istanbul many times around uh, the funding of that by India, 
from Resistable, a group of uh, left-wing uh, <coughs> activists who uh, claimed how can this biennial uh, deal with issues of gentrification when it's actually sponsored by the main uh, gentrifying uh, investment company in Turkey. I think these are the questions we should start asking these biennials rather than uh, why, which curatorial statements the curators make because all of them like to make very kind of either pseudo-humanistic or pseudo-political statements about the radicality of the biennials but we should actually start to take them a little bit to task for the political economy of these organizations. And of course the Sydney case I thought was extremely interesting uh, which actually led to the fact that this uh, main sponsor of the Sydney Biennial that also uh, builds detention camps for uh, refugees in North of Australia uh, withdrew from the biennial. So there was a successful campaign of uh, divestment. Okay, so I've talked five, five minutes, so I'm really glad it's only just five minutes because I can't speak anymore. So, uh, So I, I don't know exactly where that, that ends. They, they, have, they have so many other problems, by the way, because they have problems of... Uh, uh, yeah, politics of representation. It's very unclear to them to define, because of course it was defined in terms of very specific identity politics from the beginning, uh, that they no longer feel that they can define. So they've had a lot of other problems. So I think that's an ongoing uh, discussion, whether it, how it can be restructured or not. Uh, but with Mute it was quite interesting because they they actually decided to continue and, and most of the people who worked there then worked uh, for free and they've had a, 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 a crowdfunding um, campaign that has allowed them to and now exist only digitally so they gave up having the print version but uh, but they, they actually continue and what you can see in their politics is that they've actually become radicalized uh, which I think is so that was that was an interesting uh, I think in a way they were also happy not to always have to, to describe themselves in the Arts Council language uh, um, after a while. So it's also a question of what, how do you become radicalized and I, I don't know how much Edith will talk about that uh, with, with, with Budapest but this is for me anyway where I was critical of the of biennial is that they um, they created, oh that's good you're there, I'm referring to to Hungary Edith, so uh, <coughs> That, that what the off biennial did was to say, okay, we will make a biennial about the potentials of art, uh, and we will not protest the government because we think protest is old fashioned, so we will just show the potentials of art. And I thought that was too weak because it was a kind of, a, well, like Jose Baidotti would say, you know, we cannot have a nostalgic return to humanism, right? So this was a little bit they wanted to have a bourgeois public sphere back. So there were some potentials that I hope will be realized later on, maybe. We'll talk about this, but that, that they, that the the, the, the kind of uh, uh, constellation that they made was that it could be not only non-state institutions. So you had for the first time a biennial that was produced only by commercial galleries and alternative spaces. So I think that that, that could be an interesting alliance, of course. But uh, um, but I think that that you need to you need to be radicalized to say you know uh, we need to defend democracy against fascists doesn't work because liberals never fought fascists in history. You, know, you need, you need anti-fascists, you need communists to do that. Thank you for your presentation. I just wanted to comment to Istanbul. 
place. Mm. Um, so I live there and I'm from there. And, yeah. and, and the last edition that you mentioned, actually, uh, it was a very polemic, as you... Yes. And, and, and luckily, unluckily, it coincided with the Gizzi, very short after what happened. So actually, uh, my question and my comment, which, you know, is the criticality or the radical crit criticality, if it comes from a local group, which is not really on the rank of a, like a precious practice conceived by international community, um, you know, it was not taken seriously. And not just taken seriously, also it was um, censored by the Istanbul Cultural Foundation. A performance they wanted to do, they were kicked out. Uh, forcibly uh, from the meeting room. And then there was a group of artists got together and like wrote a kind of a, um, a letter and asked, asked that Ikasev should excuse. And, uh, and it just, the day that we were going to publish the letter, it was the 31st of May and 1st of June, which was the Gezi. And a few weeks later, Ikasev um, said sorry. They didn't apologize. It was a Turkish wording, very problematic, and it was even a discussion of translation. It, do you mean that you're sorry or you excuse? What is excuse me? What is I'm sorry? And then Hito Shera, during the opening days, made a whole performance and then make it visible that uh, dynamics of power and, you know, with the sponsor and army, because the coach also sponsors um, Tanks and arm, not just only responsible of gentrification. I mean, it's beyond that. You know, we have a war for 40 years. So, and then it was applauded, and you know, it was amazing. It was only for the international community, almost packed, and and that's it. So, yeah, yeah. like it. No, it's 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 it's. I mean, this is. Uh... First of all, I, I think that, that, that the, the, the strategies that were adopted by the biennial in that case were wrong. Um, but uh, that's easy for me to say, so it doesn't really matter what I think in that case. But um, the, the question is, of course, if, if, if we as cultural producers think that we, we can be and should be aligned with social movements or not. And that, that doesn't necessarily only happen in, in those cases, it's more general. Uh, Orientation, let's say, yeah, some more general politics, and this is, of course, the, I mean, this is the biggest complication. So, um, probably in Sydney, probably in Sao Paulo, uh, probably here at Macpa, there was solidarity among the uh, all the artists and, 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 and the art workers working on the project. But in so many other cases, you won't find that at all. And in general, in the art world, you won't find it at all. So, uh, we are also striated. Uh, you know, I think this is where uh, I would partially agree with what, what, what Paul said about being a political subject. I think we are political subjects, but in very different ways. So I think we are straddled by class and class interest too. So the, 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 the big issue is always, you know, okay, if we, if we think of these kind of political strategies, uh, uh, um, you know, if, uh, art strikes, etc., do we then also, uh, do we have the capacity uh, to uh, prevent one of our colleagues from doing what we don't want to do, right? So this is this is the political. This would we would have to do as a political collective body. So okay, if we withdraw from this exhibition, we should come in and force the others to do it too. Well, <clears throat> okay, next. <laughs> <laughs>